We're going to discuss today language and identity focusing on age. Um, before we do that, I did see an article the other day that I thought was really funny and it kind of jump starts our discussion on, you know, what are the different um, languages that people use depending on their age. So this is the nine slang words teens and Gen Zers are using in 2020 uh, in their boomer equivalents. Um, and you can tell me whether or not these are actually, actually true. So um, the term fit, right? The British use the term fit as to mean attractive, but in the United States, fit means um, a shortened version of outfit. And they said the closest term for a boomer would be threads, right? And then it also has this um, discrepancies between fire and groovy. Spilling the tea uh, is kind of sharing gossip. Uh, whereas the boomer equivalent would be the skinny. Something that is lit to describe something amazing, exciting, high energy, great. Uh, whereas boomers would say something was loaded. Wig, um, something new for me. Wig is a phrase used to refer to something so amazing that your wig flew off. Uh, so if someone posts a photo, you would comment wig. Um, and the boomer equivalent would be fab, short for fabulous. Big yikes, uh, referring to something so embarrassing that you need a much larger larger version than just a yikes. Uh, the boomers would say bummer. To be salty about something, so you're annoyed about something, um, something you're upset. Uh, the boomers would say you're slightly ticked off. A look um, is a signature physical trait, right? A carefully constructed outfit or appearance. Um, the boomer version would be someone is decked out. To go off on someone means to uh, encourage, uh, you know, uh, something, a rant maybe. Um, also, the equivalent for going off on someone is to flip your wig. So that's two versions of wigs that we have so far. So I thought that was very interesting um, introduction to language and age. And so I'm not going to ask you whether or not you're a Gen Zer. I'm not going to ask you whether or not you're a millennial. I'm not going to ask you whether or not you're a boomer, uh, greatest generation, right? I'm not going to ask you for your age, but, you know, just consider the kinds of language that people use depending on their age, um, how uh, kind of language encapsulates some of some of the thought patterns and why a lot of people might be resistant uh, to, for example, older people using um, using these these recent terms, right? So linguists, we study language um, in variation to kind of uh, underscore, understand people's identities. And part of their identities is to locate themselves in a multidimensional society. Um, hearers also use language as a marker, so they're able to kind of understand where someone's coming from based on, um, you know, what language choices that they use. They're able to locate others in that society. And age, like we talked about with gender, like we talked about with ethnicity, um, it's just another dimension of the social space. Unfortunately, and we'll talk about this later, but a lot of people also use, use um you know, kind of age and certain in and uh, certain language effects that um, older people use as a means of discrimination. And so, you know, this is a social um, a social stratification, but doesn't necessarily mean a chronological dimension. So, uh, individuals do have a choice uh, in in um, dictating this. So, for example, it does not mean that because you're over sixty, you're going to use the words groovy, right? Um, language choices are necessary to an individual and to one's idiot like as we mentioned in previous lectures. So how do you construct an identity at various life stages? Um, you know, what is your childhood identity? How does that differ from your adolescence? How does that differ from adulthood or old age? You know, um, especially some of you who um, are attending college for the first time or university for the first time, you know, how... Um, different were you from a year ago or two years ago or five years ago so we're constantly changing our identities and our speech patterns also reflect those changes 
um, you know, when we label age groups, um, there's different labels that we use uh, depending on how our society um, encapsulates different different life trajectories. So, for example, we might call uh, someone who's um, under five a youngster. We might call them a girl or a boy, a minor, a newborn, a kid, a kiddo, an infant, a baby, a toddler. And it's okay to infantilize um, them, right, in the speech, right? It's culturally um, kind of accepted. But what would happen, per se, if we were to use these terms to refer to older folks or to minorities or to women, right? If we were to call someone a girl versus a woman, if we call someone a kiddo, you know, uh, and then an adult, what would that mean? What will we call people who are from, you know, 20 to 60 years of age? Will we call them an adult? Will we call them a mature person, a woman, a man, a lady and gentleman? Um, recalling back to our lecture on language and gender, you know, some of these um, some of these age groups, c clarifications, they may be very different, right? Especially, um, you know, when we move forward into non-binary spaces, you know, we might not call them a woman or a man or a lady or gentleman anymore. We might just call them a person. And also, what do we call people who are over 65? Should we call them an adult, a mature person, elderly, retiree, senior citizen, old sir, age, geriatric? Boomer. So, you know, when I created this PowerPoint, this wasn't a part of the choices, but uh, listening to kind of the discourse on the internet, you know, is boomer a derogatory term? Is Gen Z a derogatory term? Uh, what about millennial? And in what ways in which people um, on the internet and off the internet use these words uh, to kind of denigrate others? So what age do you associate with, with these um with these life events, living alone, high heels and short skirts, getting married, raising children, drinking alcohol, drinking a sports car, having others make decisions for you. Um, in previous lectures for ML 190, uh, I would show the word such as adulting, right? And I would ask my students, you know, what does adulting mean to you? And each response was different. Some people would say, you know, adulting means I'm paying the bills, right? Or adulting means I made my first car purchase. Um, adulting could also mean that, um, you know, you're living um, by yourself for the first time or, uh, you know, it could be a minor task, right? Like I booked a um, appointment with my dentist without my mom telling me to do so. That's adulting. So, you know, as we go throughout time, what it is considered to be an adult may be very different from um, what was considered to be an adult in generations past. Uh, you know, I, I guarantee you something like being an adult would be going off to war, right? Um, and something minute as calling the dentist might not be considered being an adult, right? So um, these values of age, they really change over time, and it has less to do about how old you are in a numerical sense and more to do with a kind of societal shift as far as how we look at um, different age groups. So, you know, what age should we start this is it okay to display affection in public right um this might be different culturally for those cultures who don't show active pda um what age can you run a marathon run for president retire become pregnant enroll in a four-year college receiving a heart transplant right so different people have different stereotypes about age and you know these stereotypes might be founded um in 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 uh, moments of truth or moments past. So for example, you know, it was very common when my, my mom was growing up to be pregnant when you were 22, right? Um, and, you know, f at for my generation, um, you know, I would say that a lot of people are waiting for uh, marriage until later. They're waiting to have children. They're just now, you know, having children in their early 30s. So having a child at tw age of 22 is kind of unfathomable, you mm -hmm. know, um, in today's society. You know, so I wonder how that's going to change in the, in the in the future and depending on, you know, what kind of social groups, what kind of cultures you live in um, and, you know, what kind of communities um, that you participate in. 
So age variation, um, linguists have studied the ways in which people have, uh, you know, how they talk differently based on what life stages they are. So there's obviously certain components of language development. So when you're a baby, it sounds very different than when you're an adolescent. And it's not, and older people also speak differently than younger people. people. And that's really just how uh, language changes. It's a natural part of language use. So when you get older, your voice uh, starts to change, right? Or, uh, you know, when you develop into puberty, your your voice, your vocal cords, um, you know, develop for some of you. And so this is uh, this is something that's very natural. You can also predict language ch- changes based on performance of old versus young speakers. Um, so we're able to kind of see in real time, you know, uh, what are a person's languages over, over the course of 50 plus years. Uh, and so we're able to kind of look at languages of 10 year olds, 20 year olds, 30 year olds. We're able to kind of see at the moment how a person's language changes, uh, by following these longitudinal studies. And so right now, if you're from the age of 18 to 35, how you will talk now will probably determine how you'll talk in the future. You know, once the words come out um, in and out of fashion and, and, you know, some of the words that I showed you before will no longer be relevant. And honestly, your great grandchildren or your grandchildren will probably make fun of you for them. Um, So talking about, you know, the, the linguistic norms of age development. So you know, um, a lot of you will see this if you, uh, this probably jumpstarts a lot of memories if you are, uh, have taken my MLL 190 course, but you know, the first year you're really looking at the first word and the first word is your end all be all, right? So someone could say cheerio, right? Does that mean that, um, you know, they're, if that's the first word, does that mean that they want cheerios? Is cheerios their favorite, you know, is, are they saying hello? Is it a British baby? Right? So, we don't know because there's so much context developed around this first world word. Um, and in two years, they can develop their first sentences. And their first sentences end up being something that's very telegraphic speech. So you have a subject and you have a verb, but, uh, you know, you might have an object, right? But there's there's really no, um, you know, you, you, there's really no articles. There's no adjectives at, at the very beginning. There's no prepositions. And so you're really dealing with, like, the bare bones of a language it's like someone's writing a telegram to you and then three years old you can really start talking about ideas and feelings that you have um and this is you know where the brain starts to cognitively develop uh to where you can talk about um you know things that you're seeing you talk about abstractions uh and then you know from puberty onward you can talk about uh topics with social and linguistic complexity and of course when we talk about language development i want to give the caveat here that we're talking about first language development because learning um, a new language or learning something as a second language might be something that's very different So, um, you know, when adults talk to young children, they do so in a very particular way. Um, A lot of linguists would call this child-directed speech. A lot of you have probably heard it being referred to as motherese, um, although that is a contested term because it has its connotations that only a mother can speak to children this way or a mother is a main caretaker when their, you know, fathers and other caretakers are, are involved. But you know, when adults talk to children, they kind of focus on the here and now. They'll say, build me a tower, pick up the blocks. That's a puppy. He's very soft and furry. Or the puppy's in the basket. So adults are really trying to teach their children, you know, spatial awareness. And, you know, you can probably notice an inflection I had there. You know, it said it was very high and low and it varied a lot. That's a puppy, right? Versus that's a puppy. And someone who will say, you know, very monotone things to your your children might not get um, get picked up on, right? Um, and so this kind of baby talk, um, you know, with these elongated vowels, exaggerated intonation, simplified sentence structure, diminutive suffixes, so saying like, um, you know, instead of saying dog, we'd say, oh, look at the doggy, right? So, um, you know, have, adding an IE to the end, having an uh, onomatopoeia, right? 
So some some uh, examples would be kitty cat or mommy or daddy or night night or choo choo, right? So some, something that's uh, that's you know repetitive for for the children. And you know they've done research to see whether or not this actually helps in children's literacy um, literacy development. And really, the results are inconclusive. So in some cultures, um, I think there's one study that looks at uh, Mayan caretakers, Mayan mothers, uh, and they, you know, wouldn't, um, or I think they did actually speak to their children in this kind of term. And it wasn't necessarily that uh, uh, about what they said, it was mostly the intonation, right? So the kind of up and down and up and down, you know, kitty cat and doggy, you know, uh, that helped to kind of uh, create this kind of awareness of for the children of this phonetic um, phonetic variety for the kids but it wasn't necessarily that the kids became smarter or you know read more or you know or performed in any other way uh, other than they just had this more phonemic awareness so you know adults will try to also correct their children with the truth but they also but they would not tell them about grammar right they would not say oh hey child you know i noticed that you said this like you really need a past tense ed marker you know a, it an interaction go, would go something like this a child would point and say doggy and the adult would say no that's a horsey right and so notice the ways in which this person said horse horsey sorry instead of a horse and child would say, that's the fa animal farmhouse. An adult would say, no, that's the lighthouse. And the children points to a picture of a bird and say, birdhouse. And the adult would say, yes, the bird's sitting on a nest, right? So adults will reiterate or, um, you know, uh, have more inflection on these kinds of words because it wants them to teach the, to the young children. Uh, and the adults are not saying like, oh, you're wrong or anything like that. They'll agree and they'll say, mm, yeah, it's more like a nest, right? We would call that a nest uh, in the hopes that the child will understand um, the corrections here. So, you know, do children learn through the structured input of, you know, child-directed speech? Um, and although the research shows that although infants prefer to listen to child-directed speech, that makes sense. You don't want to listen to someone who's monotone, right? You don't want to listen to a lecture of someone who's just droning on and on. The controlled studies show that caregiver speech does not directly affect the ch child's language development. So that means that, um, you know, the, no matter how you talk to your child, your child will continue to um, speak and learn language just fine. And we're talking, of course, about their native language. Um, and, you know, more to this point, um, that there's in many cultures, like Samoan culture, the tribes of Papua New Guinea, and the Gisi of Kenya, they do not use a separate register or, you know, look directly at their babies at all. And, you know, their babies, they continue to learn their language just fine. So, you know, a lot of people would say, uh, you know, it's not that they don't um, care about their babies or they don't want their babies to learn. But it's a natural, they believe that language is a natural process, right? And they said, okay, well, you know, when my child grows up, my child will be able to learn this language and speak this language to me like I'm an adult. Um, so they're just kind of waiting for that moment. It's not something to where, you know, I think we live in a, in, in the West, we live in a very child-centric culture in which we have to have, uh, you know, the kids talking all the time. And if they're not talking, if they're not little baby Mozarts, then they're gonna be murderers. So you know, so we have this kind of fear of, uh, you know, my baby's not talking, my baby's not speaking. A lot of people also ask me some bilingual advice, right? So like they would say, you know, my my child's not really um, speaking in English right now. You know, what should I do? And you know, my response to that is, your child is learning both languages. It's learning you know, the native language, and it's also learning English at the same time, you know, growing up in the United States. So, you know, just give your child some time to develop during their silent period, and eventually they'll start talking. And actually, when they turn f about four or five years old, they won't stop talking. So you'll kind of wish that they were silent. 
Um, so, you know, these are natural stages. It's okay for a child not to be speaking. It's okay for, you know, not to speak to your child, um, because different cultures do it all the time. Although I know that that seems kind of blasphemous, right? So, um, you know, when we talk about language, we talk about the different discourse markers, uh, that form. And so, um, we're going to just move on to, uh, from childhood to adolescence. And so, um, you know, these discourse markers are words or phrases that serve a function in conversation. You know, I've been listening to my lectures and I noticed that I use a lot of ums. I use a lot of likes. I use a lot of, you knows, right. I use a lot of rights. And so this is to indicate agreement, approval, understanding, um, because I don't have someone nodding their heads, you know, that I'm looking at. So these are words I'm using to kind of illustrate or to, to keep going um, and to kind of figure out if the other person, uh, you know, uh, is, 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 well, now that, you know, I've, uh, am reading about these discourse markers, I can't help not to do it. So anyways, uh, we looked at discourse markers in Valley Girl Discourse in the socioelect of white women from Southern California. And linguists looked at the characterized by high rising intonation and notably like. So a lot of their speech was peppered in these like, like, like. Um, this is a very, very, very contagious feature. And obviously it doesn't mean that these people aren't smart. These are, this is just a discourse marker to help them index things like uh, that they're listening or that they are experiencing some back channeling. They're approving, they're understanding, they're expressing agreement. And uh, a lot of linguists also notice that the word like comes from Australia. So it's actually not a Southern, made in Southern California in that it, it was created by the surfers in California who then brought it over to the surfers uh, in Southern California, or sorry, surfers in Australia who bought it to the surfers in Southern California. So they looked at the age uh, group and looked at uh, not like, but the frequency of just. So I just wanted to do this, or I'm just checking in. Uh, he just, you know, so this is a discourse marker. It, it um, conveys information of agreement and, uh, of, of approval and understanding. And they noticed that this was a very common usage in adolescence. So, um, you know, as uh, the more that someone um, is from the ages of 17 to 19 years old, the more likely they're able to use this, uh, you know, Valley Girl discourse of just. Texting. Texting is something that, you know, we don't talk we talk a lot about with regarding adolescence, but you know, this happens with every age group now with um, with technology, and the ways in which we create norms are very age based. So, for example, if I were to ask you, do you prefer for someone to call you or to text you? So, if you're a young adult, if you're about eighteen to twenty four years old, um. Probably someone to text you would be more preferable. If you're a little bit older than that, um, if you're probably around um, 35 or older, you probably want someone to call you instead. And so these are, you know, this uh, connotes a difference, right? So, you know, a lot of teens have cell phones. A lot of uh, messages are sent per day. And there's a sense of uh, community being built by texting or there's certain messages that you could relay via text that would be very different if someone called you. Text speak is a feature of spoken vocabulary. Um, you know, the other day I was talking to my coworker and I said, lol, right, LOL. And so this, you know, just kind of bleeds into everyday discourse because texting is very much a natural part of life. Um, you know, and, and I'm kind of thinking about the ways in which emojis, right? So, um, emojis are a way to illustrate certain emotions that regular text cannot. So the vernacular usage or slang, as we call it, 
um, in noticing, of course, children, adolescents use a high, the highest amount of slang. Um, but you know, middle people use less and, and that's, that's, um, that's common, right? Middle aged people, so their parents, right? But there's also this uptick in older people trying to increase, uh, beginning to increase slang usage again. So, you know, this is, this is, a, a kind of a stark, um, disparity between generations and also kind of a um, connection point between the oldest generation and also the youngest generation. So, you know, as far as slang usage or what's considered to be slang, um, the middle-aged people use the least just because, um, you know, they want to create a, a difference between the different languages. So, for example, um, you know, when children use certain slang, because it's different to the kind of usage that uh, the generation before it used, it creates a sense of opposition, right? Whereas older people, they don't really have this kind of opposition and they don't really, you know, because once they're older, you know, and past a childbearing age, they can have a, you know, they don't have to be uh, a role model per se. So, you know, this could also explain why a lot of older texters would say you for you, the letter U. Um, but, you know, that's kind of fallen out of favor amongst the, the younger texters, right? Um, would you ever say you too, right? Um, using the letter U and using the number two, right? Uh, this is something to where, you know, we notice that older people are texting in a in very, we wouldn't say childish, infant, infantile kind of way, but kind of like in a way that's very outdated, right? And it's kind of like they are learning how to text for the first time. So this this is, you know, very interesting topic to to look at. Maybe some of you can write about this in your discussion board and examining the ways in which people uh, continue to use technology, especially as they grow older. Because I'm sure, you know, I'm not on TikTok, but, you know, a lot of teens are. I'm sure a lot of you are. And, that, and um, you know, just knowing in the future that uh, TikTok will be very old and, and the youth will be on another platform and uh, the way that they talk will be very different, right? So that's it's kind of a rise in tide of uh, the cycle of life. And so um, they looked at, you know, whether or not people are standard, whether or not people swear, whether or not they use slang. And they noticed that adult women are more likely to be standard users. Um, and, uh, you know, in comparison to uh, male adults and, and also in comparison to adolescents. The women adults are less likely to uh, also use slang, whereas, you know, a lot of male adults will use slang, a lot of adolescents will use slang. So the kinds of uh, vocabulary that we use are also gendered, right? So, um, you know, the older uh, a person is, you know, the more likely that they're able to use more standardized terms. And why is that? Well, it could be that they're a role model for their children now if they decide to have children. Um, so they're less likely to swear and less likely to use slang. So, you know, talking about the different lexicons. So lexicon is just a really fancy word for uh, vocabulary, right? So the vocabulary uh, that we use changes as we age. Elder speech, um, you know, elder to classify elder speech, linguists have looked at the ways in which older people um, speak, and they notice some patterns. So, for example, it's very tangential. Um, when you're talking to someone, maybe they'll wander off topic. It's vacillating. Sometimes they can't make decisions. It's repetitive. They repeat some of the same words or some of the same stories. They kind of forget that. Um, you know, you've already said the same thing or they'll repeat certain stories. And sometimes elder speech is too wordy. The speakers give just too many details that aren't very um, needed for the interaction. So we talked about the ways in which adults will talk to children. How do people talk to the elderly? Well, there's a lot of different features. There's avoidance. So people avoid talking to the elderly uh, or they'll avoid... Um, you know, a, a long conversation and could be because they don't want to be quote unquote trapped, right? Um, with someone who might be too wordy or someone who might be too gentle. 
They might be impatient with with a elderly person because they're you know an elderly person might be trying to recollect ideas, and you know if you have tasks to do, you might not have time to wait. There might be a controlling talk,、um, in which you know you might say that's not really how that happened, or you know you're not really telling the truth.、Uh, so this this is a, a very common occurrence of of a way in which a speaker might use power over an elderly person. There's something called elderly speak, which we'll talk about later. But this is kind of condescending tone that you'll use, right? Overly familiar.、Um, so you know, instead of showing an elderly person respect, you'll you'll kind of、um, refer to them as their first names,、uh, or say Miss So and So, and say Hey, buddy, how are you doing today?、Uh, so using you know、um, using phrases such as friends when you might not be friends with this person. You could be shouting to an elderly person.、Uh, this is very common because a lot of people think that、um, elderly people have hearing loss, and some don't. Condescension I mentioned earlier. You know,、um, oh, it's very good that you could go. You know, make yourself a meal. You know, things like that.、Uh, to where a lot of people、uh, assume things about elderly people, and, and they use language in a way to convey that condescension, or they might be dismissive. Um, they probably say, "Oh well, you're old, so you don't really know that much about technology, or you don't know much about,、um, you know, this topic, right? Or you grew up in a different time. Like you're, you don't understand, you know, what it's like to live in this century, what it's like to live、um, in today's society."、Um, so you know, a lot of the speech is、uh, over accommodation. You can. Be patronizing. You could use some of the same baby talk forms and saying like, "Oh, that's a doggy," right?、Uh, for elderly people, being overly familiar, like I mentioned earlier, using stereotypical features of elder speech when addressing the elderly. So, for example, here's an、um, here's some features. So, a person might use a sing-songy voice, like changing the pitch and tone, exaggerating words, very similar to child-directed speech. You might. Tend to simplify the length and complexity of your sentences.、Uh, you might be speaking louder or more slowly,、uh, even the person though the person can hear you fine. You might be using limited vocabulary or repeating or paraphrasing things that you just said, using terms like "honey" and "dear," which could be condescending,、uh, and using statements that sound like questions、um, because you are,、um, you know, kind of speaking to them as if they were a child. So this is very common. A lot of、uh, people have looked at the ways in which people talk to elders in nursing homes and hospitals and other settings, and it's not necessarily based on their behavior. So there's not something about older people that triggers this、uh, form, and it's not something that is a natural occurrence. It's something that is culturally、uh, and socially、uh, used. It's based on stereotypes.、Uh, You know, used in response. It's used in response to high functioning and linguistically competent adults. So you will say things like "Good morning, fella. Are we ready for our bath?" So this is something that's very familiar. Like, "Hi, sweetie. It's time for our exercise today. Let's get ready to walk down the hall." You know. So this is something that can be considered again very、uh, patronizing to someone who's an elder. And then more research looked at the intergenerational effects, you know, about how college students speak to their parents and grandparents, and they noticed that the speech directed to their grandparents had a higher pitch, were more feminine, were more deferential, and were more unpleasant、uh, than the speech used to direct towards their parents, which is very, very interesting. So consider the ways in which you know, if you're a college age student. Uh, you know, whatever that means, and how you speak to people who are older than you or people who are younger than you,、uh, and why. Under accommodation、um, is the opposite. It's not communicating in, in accordance to people's needs. So you're not showing that you're listening. You're scrolling on your phone. You're interrupting. You're showing dismissive comments. Saying that's not what happened, being condescending, or you just get up and leave. You leave the conversation,、uh, and that could be a form of、um, a, a form of speech targeted towards elderly. And you might not know you might not notice that you're doing this. A lot of this, of course, is rooted in ageist stereotypes. So elder speak plays into the the stereotype that 
elderly are forgetful. They don't understand. They're sick. They're unattractive. They're useless. They're lonely. Um, and this is, you know, used in a lot of the societal discourse about older people. When we talk about older people, we, we, you know, we would, we would say someone's an old man. You know, they would say, "Get off my lawn." They're shrews. They're just spondent, curmudgeons, impaired. Right? Older adults are often marginalized. They're given low social status, ignored in the media, or portrayed in roles reinforcing those negative stereotypes. And those stereotypes come alive in a lot of the linguistic situations that people find themselves in. Um. So here are the discussion questions for this week. How do you talk to babies, to kids, to older adults, elderly people? How does your speech change over time? When do you think people start talking like adults? What does the term "talking like adults" talk? You know, how do adults talk? What do babies talk like, and what do older people talk like? Can you guess someone's age by their voice? And、uh, on the last point, how do you see ageism play out in everyday life? Interested to hear your thoughts, and I will see you on the discussion board.